Okay, I think it's about time to uh, introduce our luncheon keynotes. We've got a very interesting format here today. We're kind of we're kind of going for the Charlie Rose times two, and we're going to have two excellent speakers. Admiral U.S. Navy retired Mark Fitzgerald, Lieutenant General U.S. Air Force retired Dave Deptula in a conversation with Frank Hoffman. Frank will introduce uh, those two gentlemen to talk about the air-sea battle. We thought it was appropriate to have this discussion because this topic has elicited and emoted uh, a certain response among the whole military side and I dare say the defense contractor side. It's been months now that ASB appears in periodicals and newspapers like the New York Times as ASB. And yet there's still people out there going, what is it? And what does it mean to me? So we've decided to name our theme for this discussion, what should it be? So let me introduce Frank here. Frank Hoffman is currently a senior research fellow at the Institute for National Strategic Studies at the National Defense University, where he also serves as director of the NDU Press, which produces policy and strategy related research projects, as well as the Joint Forces Quarterly. Frank was commissioned in the NROTC the University of Pennsylvania in 1978 as a second lieutenant in the U.S. Marine Corps. His military career includes nearly 24 years of service as a military infantry officer. He served on presidential commissions. He served on almost every study you can imagine. He's advised the Defense Science Board. He's one of those people who just seems to be everywhere. And he's everywhere because people know that Frank is a go-to guy when it comes to higher level thinking. Colonel Hoffman is a graduate of Pennsylvania's Wharton School. He is a frequent lecturer around the globe and a prolific contributor to the professional military and foreign policy journals. He's a good friend of the Naval Institute and AFSEA as well as a frequent commentator in proceedings where Frank has published, th this is worth a note, no less than 30 feature articles and professional notes over the past 20 years. Ladies and gentlemen, Colonel Frank Hoffman. Can I just bring them up on stage? Uh, Admiral and General, can you just join me up on the stage, please? We're going to do this a little uh, less formally than we do in the past, I think. Uh, it's a great honor to be here today. Uh, I'd like to thank AFSEA and the Naval Institute. Uh, as somebody who's been around the, the joint warfighting community for, uh, for a number of decades now, uh, I think you should take a bow for having created what is clearly, I think, the premier joint uh, warfighting event around the nation. Uh, so I think it's something to be very proud of and something that should be well recognized. We're so, jo we're so joint. We have a, a Marine infantryman flanked by a, uh, an Air Force fighter pilot and a Navy fighter pilot. So I feel very comfortable and very safe up here. I understand that uh, actually the title of our panel has been changed somewhat by General Cartwright's comments. You know, the, uh, I think we should uh, call this panel In Search of the Holy Grail. And I don't have a problem with that because I'm a, I'm a fan of Monty Python movies. Uh, are there any Mandarin speakers in the room? <laughs> I know, imagine that, no Chinese speakers. I, I, I wanted to know if anybody knew how to say uh, the holy hand grenade of Antioch in Mandarin. And I sent out an email to, I have three Chinese speakers at the university, at uh, National Defense University, and none of them really could come up with that, so I'm a little bit disappointed. But maybe we can work with that uh, motif a little bit over the day. So at the risk of demonizing uh, a very large country in the Asian uh, region, 
Uh, we're going to talk about air sea battle here a little bit today in a little bit of a conversation. And we're going to try to demystify some of the myths, misconceptions, or misinterpretations, I think, that are floating around about that particular concept. Uh, now, I, I've never spoken in this format up here, I, so I called David Hartman yesterday, and I said, uh, Dave, you know, how do you do this thing? I'm used to being a moderator, but I've never been a conversationalist. And he said, Frank, there's only one thing you have to remember. You're sort of like the corpse at an Irish wake. You're really not necessary for the party, because everybody's there for something else, and you're not expected to have a speaking role. So I'm not going to take much of a speaking role today. I'm, I'm just going to ask a few questions and get this conversation going. Nor am I going to uh, extensively try to introduce two very well-known uh, scholars, leaders, and warfighters. I've known General Deptula since uh, 1994, where we shared a cubicle rather painfully for a better part of a year or so uh, on the Roles and Missions Commission. Uh, he is a well-known air power fighter pilot, air power theorist, national security intellectual, uh, and, and now an ISR expert and a, and a leadership scholar at uh, the Air Force Academy. Uh, it's been a great honor to have worked with General Deptool over a number of years. Admiral Fitzgerald and I have a common background in the Department of the Navy over long parts of our careers since the 1970s. He too is a fighter pilot, a leader, a great staff officer, and more importantly, a commander of a strike group, operational uh, JFAC deputy, and uh, second fleet commander, and probably the hardest job that I've had to deal with is the director of the Navy staff, which is a really thankless job. So uh, without further ado, we'll get going on with our conversation here. I'm going to get around here without killing anybody. So, we have the microphones on? Yep, we're working. We're live. So let's get to the, uh, the really $640 billion question. Why a concept called air-sea battle? What is it and why now? Thanks, Frank. Um, you know, I, I think this concept has its roots uh, several years ago when we started talking about missile defense. And you say, well, missile defense, what does that have to do with air-sea battle? I think the Navy quickly came to the realization that as we started seeing the proliferation of, uh, of Scud missiles and then ballistic missiles, uh, and then we saw um, countries like China that were using these missiles to, to target our, our battle groups that uh, the Navy realized that they couldn't do it all by themselves. And they said, we, we have got to start thinking about how do we reduce salvo size against our, our forces at sea? How do we uh, get access to these spaces that now can be uh, potentially denied to us? So. Uh, we started thinking very strongly about um, it's not just shooting the arrow with the arch or the archer uh, shooting the arrow uh, against the incoming arrow, but how do you uh, start to, to get at this whole anti-axis problem? The, uh, the air-sea battle, I think, was meant to be an operational concept, and it should be an operational concept that sits under some strategic framework. That strategic document is the Joint Operational Access concept, uh, which is indeed something for everyone. I mean, it's you can drive a truck through that thing. Uh, and so this was meant to be a very sp specific um, operational concept underneath that. Uh, when you start thinking of the challenges of the future, vice the challenges of the present, you start getting into some very interesting challenges. Um, I, I think everyone out here would say, you know, after looking what happened in, in Libya, what's happened uh, uh, in, in the many other places that we've gone in the last 20 years, uh, we have a pretty darn good force to do uh, what I would call the current ERC battle. But when you start looking to the future, and it really isn't about China, it's about where are these new technical capabilities going to go? Uh, they could go, I mean, it's not just about China, it's China exports to, to many nations that we don't have uh, particularly good relationships with. Those capabilities can now start to hold our forces at risk. And so when you start hearing the CNO and the Chief Staff of the Air Force talking about offense in depth, what they're talking about is how do we get at that deep sea, that 
keeps battle space uh, to hold the enemy's forces at risk. And we can't just do it with naval forces. We've got to do it with all the forces available. Now, is it just about the Navy and the Air Force? I think the Navy and the Air Force have a large part of this, uh, and so that's why right now it's, it's kind of a Navy-Air Force piece. But clearly, uh, when you start talking about things like air defense, you're talking about Army forces, when you talk about uh, offense in depth, you're certainly talking about Marine amphibious forces. And if you're talking about holding land masses, you're talking about Army. So, I think that piece will come in the future, but for now, uh, the conversation is, is mostly between the Air Force and the Navy trying to come to some agreements there. Joe, do you have anything yeah, to Yeah, let me jump in and uh, take us back, say, uh, about uh, 20 plus years ago in the aftermath of uh, what I now refer to as WW Desert Storm. Uh, and if you take a look at, from an adversary's perspective, um, how well the United States did there, and look at all the individual conflicts that were conducted in between, um, our potential adversaries have taken a look at what happens when the United States and its coalitions have time to build up forces in a particular region. Uh, they also understand that one of the linchpins of the way that we have traditionally conducted war is to buy enough time to build up those forces. So therefore, in the intervening 20 plus years, they have focused on uh, building capabilities that would deny us the ability to gain access somewhere. Ergo, the nomnaker of uh, uh, anti-access area denial. But there's a second piece here and that's the ability to overcome the time constraints to build up forces. Uh, so over the last two decades, and also within the last decade, there has been this awareness on the part of some in the United States that we've got to come to grips with the way that we've used to conduct warfare in light of advancing technologies that enable some to develop capabilities to keep us away. Uh, a precursor to air-sea battle is a concept known as global reconnaissance strike, which capitalizes on land-based and sea-based forces to rapidly project power across the breadth and depth, and not just kinetically, but non-kinetically as well. So air-sea battle is an evolution of a variety of different concepts to deny an adversary the capability to prevent us from imposing conditions that would not be conducive to them achieving their objectives. Let me just add one other piece, because there are some folks out there who would mistakenly associate this concept as aimed against a particular nation state. Um, I would suggest to you that that's not the case. What air-sea battle is about is acquiring the capability to master an environment where somebody, not anybody in particular, has the capability or attempts to deny us access. Now, you know, are there folks in the Pacific region that might do that? Well, yeah, but again, you know, um, SA-20s, SA-S-200s, uh, S-300s, S-400s, um, you know, those are built by the Russians. They're exported to whoever's got a credit card and the ability to sustain that kind of capability. So it's not a matter of just the Pacific or just the Middle East. It could be somewhere in the Western Hemisphere. So air-sea battle is not aimed at a particular nation state. It is how do we, as a nation, exploit the advantages of operating in the domains of air, sea, space, subsea, to capitalize on and build a set of interdependent actions that is so <coughs> overwhelming and impenetrable that an adversary wouldn't even attempt uh, to you know, engage uh, uh, us to acquire uh, some advantage. 
which then brings in the whole deterrent potential of air sea battle. I think that's a good point. I want to bring out something. I was reading uh, something, I think it was from the CNO uh, just recently, but he, he used the phrase strategic maritime crossroads. Uh, I think he was talking about some, some critical choke points, which are more than just in Asia. And he made, I thought, was a, a valuable strategic point, which commentators about air sea battle seem to overlook all the time. But our freedom of action and ability to go to places and interact with our partners and key trading partners is is very much tied to our strategic mobility in the air and the maritime dimension. And our treaty partners and friends are far from us in many cases, and they are being intimidated by these expanding anti-access systems. So do you see a strategic rationale for air-sea battle? Because there's this perception that it's programs in search of a concept, which is in search of a strategy. And when I listen to the CNO, he seems to make it pretty clear that he's starting from a strategic Respect. Let me jump in there, if I may, uh, because I think you hit on something that's pretty important. And, and I'll tell you right up front, I'm not a fan of the term air-sea battle, um, because that term uh, tends to focus people on the cooperation aspect between the Navy and the Air Force. And that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. But this is really about a concept of operations that has a tie directly to what I would tell you are the two enduring tenets of our national security strategy. And those are very simply put, one, that the United States military will engage forward in an attempt to secure peace and stability around the world, uh, which is the least expensive way of preventing conflict. But two, if in fact we have to fight, we'll do so away from America's shores. So therefore, there is an underlying strategic principle and basis for that concept of operations of which air-sea battle is the, the overarching name. But again, I go back to that focuses on the cooperation piece, which is great, but this is really a concept that emphasizes how do you exploit modern uh, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance systems in conjunction with long-range reach for not just force application, but uh, imposing desired effects, which may include non-kinetic pieces to achieve a denial capability of preventing an adversary from acquiring their objectives. Yeah. I, I think another point that should be made here, too, is that if air-sea battle should be owned by the COCOMs, because the COCOMs are the, the people who operationalize the, uh, the hardware that we put in the field, um, when you start talking about air-sea battle and what it should be in the future, you start getting into this crossover between the COCOMs and, and the Title X authorities of the staffs. And so I think air-sea battle is made to bridge those, those two uh, uh, different structures. And what you see is, uh, and, and the real um, issues that you will start to see are, can the COCOMs influence Washington to buy the right stuff? And uh, things that make me nervous are, uh, for instance, last week I saw the CNO blogging that they're buying, he got an extra Virginia-class submarine to do CAD for the Air Force. That, that sounds like a little bit of a stretch to me. Uh, and we've got to be very careful that the concept doesn't become a, a procurement concept by, say, uh, operational concept in the field. Yeah, but the, I, I like the CNO's point, but the, at the strategic level, he was talking about the erosion of America's credibility of sustaining the international system, sustaining our trading system, and sustaining our treaty obligations with our critical partners, those in Northeast Asia and those in the Middle East, is now at risk monopolies or assurances we used to be able to give that were not questioned are now challenged by opposing investments by other countries as well as perceptions I think in some of our friends there's writings out of uh, Australia and other places you know that that America is uh, both in a, in a material decline and a military decline and that we're distracted and that we've been pushed out that we're seeding no-go areas uh, through these critical maritime crossroads and, and I think that's a uh, an underlaying that's just, just somehow been missing because people have gotten to uh, uh, this next issue I want to bring up. The, I mean, it's been difficult to talk about air-sea battles since, you know, the 
details are, are, are in a classified concept. So we have a generic conception of what it is that we're talking about. And it's been very hard. The CNO and the Chief Staff of the Air Force have now put something out. But there is something I call a caricature that this is just a, a, a high-tech kinetic strike program package. And I think there's something more to, to this. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, your idea of this character of, uh, uh, you know, the, the Klingons being, a, you know, getting attacked by the, the Empire or whatever. Um, does, I, I, w I would say that air sea battle is trying to pull together a lot of pieces that may be going in different directions. Cyber. Um, Cyber's got to be an integral part of air sea battle because uh, everything from deception, disruption, all of the uh, uh, things that you want to do in, in as far as deceiving the enemy have got to be uh, you know, taken into this air sea battle. Uh, electronic attack, which we are woefully inadequate in. Um, how are we going to bring in, uh, you know, electronic attack into this whole whole piece? And then uh, the kinetic deep deep battle space piece is very very uh, tough. Uh, either uh, you've got to start thinking about how you're going to do uh, unmanned those kind of things, and and then. Uh, the other piece of this course is um, how do they, the KOX, the uh, Maritime Operations Centers, how do you start to uh, take and, and take these things and, and put the battle management forward? So there's, there's a lot of uh, command and control pieces that have got to be addressed in this future uh, anti-access area denial battle space. I think one of the things uh, you know, if you think back to the 1920s when the airplane came out and it was just a scout, and then the Air Force decided that, well, it was the Army Air Corps at the time, decided that they could... Those are the good old days. Should, should, have, been, they should could, have been the Air they Force. They could sink the fleet. And they <laughs> the, put, the Brits had it right. That's right. They could put bombs on airplanes. Uh, and that was, you went from evolutionary, which was the scout, to revolutionary, which was putting bombs on airplanes. I think... The revolutionary part of air sea battle is going to be in the unmanned world when you have unmanned systems up there that are in that deep battle space, unable to contact the KOC or unable to be under the direct control of, of people. And you're going to see machines taking charge and going out there and, and killing things. And they're going to be self forming networks, they're going to be uh, all of these. Uh, stand-in jammers, uh, your electronic attack uh, piece, your uh, tactical tomahawks and, and their follow-on systems, directed energy. All of those pieces are going to, the deep battle space is going to be run uh, in, in, in machine language code. And, and those are going to be the revolutionary things that happen. And so I think air-sea battle is, is a chance to start getting your arms around all of this, uh, this piece. The thing that that's what it should be, and what it is is something uh, that, that one hasn't been disclosed. But more importantly, that the acquisition side doesn't seem to be tied to the requirement side on this thing right now. I would just um, elaborate uh, by stating that this is a concept of operations that is very, very complex that involves a variety of different uh, entities, conceptually down to the programmatic pieces. Unfortunately, the tendency, uh, particularly inside the Beltway, is people uh, tend to focus on the programmatic piece. But let me borrow from the description that uh, Admiral Greener uh, has published, because I think it puts into perspective really all the parts and pieces of what Air Sea Battle is about. First, uh, networked. Two, integrated. Three, attack in depth. Okay, when you think about those three tenets in terms of principles around which to build the concept, and then how would you capitalize on those tenets to employ, you get to the next three words, you know, disrupt, which gets into the cyber piece. Destroy, 
go to the heart of what's causing the problem and then uh, deny uh, any adversary effect from imposing their desired effect on our outcomes. I think those tend to characterize the different parts and pieces that go into this concept. It's not just about things, it's about how do we tie these disparate things together. And one of the things that the United States military is very good at is transforming platforms and things into uses for which their original intent was not meant. A good case in point, uh, well, there, there's lots of them out there, but uh, you, you know, Curtis LeMay would roll over in his grave if he thought that you know, his vaunted B-52s would be used to perform close air support. Um, or as communications nodes, or as intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance platforms uh, with sensor pods on them. Um, we have got to change the way we characterize our systems because we've let historical and a traditional nomenclature create perceptions in people's minds what some of the new platforms are able to do. Some of you have heard me say before, and I'll say it again, that the F-22 and the F-35 are not Fs. They're F-B-E-A-R-C-E-W-A-W-C-S 22s and 35s. They're flying sensor platforms that will probably value more in the future for their ability to penetrate denied and contested airspace, collect information, put it into a network that now enable other systems unanticipated by an adversary to then act to create the conditions that the adversary can't work in. So we, we need to begin to think about the kinds of technologies that are enabled by the platforms that are coming on board. Not just air, I mean, I use some air examples, but you know, you can envision a time where a, uh, a U-class uh, employs a weapon um, that is designated <coughs> by a set of information derived from sensors from a sea-based asset in relationship to a space-based asset commanded by an airborne platform to divert to another target. That's the kind of interdependence and interoperability that I think the, the conceivers of air-sea battle portend for the future. Really great point. You, you brought up something in your opening comments I hadn't thought about, and your three Ds kind of reinforced my comment. We, we have as a precept of our national strategy that we want to operate forward. Part of the caricature about air-sea battles that we're on the outside fighting our way in at some, some great standoff distance. But in addition to denying and, and deflecting and, and destroying, we also want to defend both ourselves, our force posture forward. This is not about withdrawing and fighting from, from, from greater range. This is also about staying inside. It's is, both. Is I would a, suggest to you it's both. Right. You don't want to cede an advantage by uh, 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 only you know, relying on masses of capabilities, whatever they might be in whatever domain, that have to be moved forward in order to be effective, which underlies the need to emphasize some of the long-range systems that have been neglected in the past. Now, here I'm speaking about um, long-range um, reconnaissance strike platforms um, that, you know, that's the underlying rationale for why now folks are taking an interest in, hmm, maybe we do, do need to recapitalize those over 50-year-old B-52s and the only 20 B-2s that we have. I was also thinking about the distribution of our basing posture in the Middle East. Very, very important Something. and all part of this. That's why there's no silver bullet solution to uh, air sea battle and I think as Admiral Fitzgerald pointed out look this isn't just about a particular program or set of programs it is about the whole notion of how do we tie together what currently exists not just in a program perspective but also from a basing and a presence perspective that's what makes this complex you think that's where no, I, I, Dave's got it exactly right and the when you start thinking about how do you tie systems together and networks, um, we've become so reliant on wideband satellite 
we seem to think that, you know, this, it's always going to be out there. And uh, we've got to start thinking about uh, what kind of data links we need in the future, what kind of wideband networks we need in the future. When we start sending uh, platforms deep into the battle space, how are they going to communicate both with each other and how are they going to communicate back home? And uh, I don't think we've done a very good job of thinking through architectures. Uh, there's, there's no agreed wideband waveforms in DOD. There's no agreed uh, archi system architecture uh, that you can point your finger to. You know, you have a bunch of these uh, clouds and, and lightning bolts without a lot of uh, uh, system names to them. And so uh, I think this is, air sea battle is going to be a real opportunity to, to to get down and make some compromises and 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 get on with it. Um, I think you know when you look at uh, I don't want to pick on China here because China may or may not be the enemy and hopefully it won't be the enemy. China does export stuff to everybody, so we've got to pay attention to what they build. But one of the things. Uh, Steve Jobs at Apple said, before he died, he was asked, how come you produce everything in China? And he pulled out his uh, iPhone and he said, you see this? He said, for six months before we delivered the first iPhone, uh, I had it in my pocket and had a plastic uh, cover on it, vice a glass cover, and he brought it to his staff six weeks prior to going to production. He said, you see this thing? He said, what, what does it say? And nobody could read it. He said, my point exactly. He said, it's got to be glass. And in six weeks, he turned it over to his Chinese production company, who put 1,500 engineers instantly on the problem. And they instantly produced a solution. We can't do that with our acquisition community. So we're going to have to be smarter than this. We're going to have to start thinking about these problems and coming up with, with, with solutions that we can implement. Um, and, and be more like the Chinese and, 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 and get to the, uh, to the solutions quicker. Let's stovepipe across the whole joint community. We're starting to get to, to the last few uh, minutes of our time before we go to Q&A. Let me try to ask a, a pretty big wrap-up type question. Uh, both of you provided articles, that uh, one of which the Admiral's going to have published in uh, Joint Force Quarterly. Hopefully very soon, a little <laughs> plug from my journal. Uh, but both of you have written about uh, this particular topic and the need to pursue our interests uh, around the globe. But if you could be the chairman for the day and invest in something, what is the most critical capability set that you would be investing in to pursue access and influence? Um, I mean, if my money's on networks. I mean, the single biggest issue that we have out there right now is platforms talking to each other. And uh, uh, whether, it's, whether you're talking space-based or whether you're talking terrestrial, uh, we have got to fix our networks. Institutional inertia. It's not about technology. It is about institutional inertia and overcoming resistance to change. We have to start thinking outside the box. Uh, that would be uh, the single biggest thing that I would, I would do something yeah, about. You have to encourage people to think differently. Uh, we, we, are, we are not going to be able to get through the resource constraints that we've all known about for 20 plus years, and they've only just gotten worse because of economic conditions around the world, but we're not going to get through these in the Department of Defense just by simply buying less of what we already have. We have to think differently and open our minds to new ways of doing business. I think it's a great point. Uh, your, Admiral, your comments uh, brought up a, a potential weakness. Are, are we creating vulnerabilities for ourselves with, with networks and space-based systems in a, in a theater that, that space parity or our posture in space may be as vulnerable as our basing posture in some regions of the world? Is it a single point of failure or can we, can we create the kinds of networks, I think you talked to earlier, that uh, reduce that over-reliance? Well, I mean, clearly redundancy overcomes those kind of issues. But I think there's a lot of solutions that are available out there. Um, you know, do, do we get a tenfold increase in power through the networks? I think you do. And so uh, when those networks are taken away, you get a tenfold decrease in power. You probably do. 
So we've got to figure out how we're going to how we're going to solve that problem. Yeah. And there are innovative ways. You know, space our space architecture is very very fragile. Um, we've had that brought to our attention uh, recently. Um, but the solution just shouldn't be, well, let's figure out a quicker way we can reconstitute the space-based architecture. Well, no, there are other venues, sea-based, land-based, air-based, that you can rapidly reconstitute network elements such that, and if you do this in a multiplicity of different ways across a variety of different domains, this is the kind of challenge that air sea battle envisions creating the conditions that it's so difficult for an adversary to break into this honeycombed network of systems that they go, well, you know, it's, it's not worth um, their adventurous tendencies to even go there. So in many respects, air sea battle has the potential of, of becoming an integral part of our national and military strategies uh, and I, I hold out high hopes for the deterrent piece, which serves everybody uh, to good benefit. I think that's a good point to wrap up on. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left for uh, questions from the floor. Uh, we have a microphone, and we have microphones over here and over here. If anybody would like to ask our two distinguished guests some hard questions, tie some dots together. You, sir, it's yours. Yeah, I'll jump on that grenade. Um, Scott Kinner with the Marine Corps Tactics and Operations Group. Uh, something that was just said by the panel, uh, and, and I won't attribute it to any in particular, but um, it, it kind of runs in the uh, counter to what we've been hearing for the last couple of days, which is about uh, balancing uh, ways and means uh, with a strategy. In other words, we have to start accepting risk. And we've heard everything from people who volunteered that perhaps we accept some risk and readiness in order to get modernization or vice versa. And so when we talk about air-sea battle, and it's both about staying forward or then being able to get forward. Um, and the example I believe given was a BPT-2, and it can do many things, but I think some would argue that it's an extraordinarily expensive way to gather intel. So if we can't do all things, um, what uh, in the AC ASB concept, where do we accept risk? Thank you. Where do we accept risk in ASB? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll start it out. I, I, I think you can have an incremental approach to this thing. And we've, uh, we've clearly already got capability uh, that gets us there. Um, I, I think you've got to prioritize what are the, what are the challenges? Um, what are the things that are, are going to do those and what, what's going to create anti-access? You know, if you look in the Straits of Hormuz, you know, it's pretty simple. It's mines, it's, uh, it's missiles, and, uh, you know, and then it's small boats, small boats. And then uh, as you start to look to the years, then is Iran going to start developing long-range missiles that are going to start threatening whatever? So I think, you know, you've got to take the near problem first and, and work your way up. So that's the risk you're going to take is that you can develop the counter systems be before they develop their systems. Um, you know, the, the, the basing issues, the other piece, do you, do you build bases that are within the enemy's footprint or do you walk yourself outside of those or bases? And work disperse or invest in that really complex technology called concrete. Uh, <laughs> So there's a, you know, there's a plethora of, of risk alternatives there, and uh, I, I would say you take the current threat first. Um, I would throw out um, that you take risk in manpower-intensive excessive redundancies. Now think about that for a while, but also think about the reconnaissance strike complex that the United States have imposed on its adversaries and what that's done to them. Um, they don't mass anymore with large numbers of whatever, whether it's armies uh, or navies or air forces, because once you mass, what have we done? What our precision strike 
network has been able to do is to reduce, uh, you know, large uh, ground organizations, if you will, to dismounted infantry. Uh, what has our um, reconnaissance strike complex done to um, organizations uh, like Al Qaeda in Afghanistan, Pakistan? is caused them to run to ground. So you're not gonna have large numbers of anything engaging in uh, mono e mono conflict anymore because it's simply not survivable. So that's where I'd take risk. Yeah, but that's a very interesting question. It's sort of a strategic question to an operating concept and it kind of rubs against the problem of you know, what's, what is a concept supposed to achieve. But uh, we go to, over here to the, I believe it's a petty officer. Good afternoon, Petty Officer Gothier, Sector Stratcom. Um, I'm not going to pretend like I really understand air sea battle. Try to read a lot about it, try to get my head around it. Just doesn't click for me. But one thing I'm wondering is on the deck plates. Something that I might have to do. Something the corporal right there might have to do. Is anything going to change for us in terms in terms of our everyday jobs and how we fight wars because of air sea battle? Can, can, can you repeat that? Yeah, sort of the. What is anything going to change from a day to day basis? if we implement air-sea battle. Well, that's I guess a, if, let me jump in here. Another way to say it is anything going to really change on the tactical level because of this strategy? Yes, absolutely it will. I, at, at first, I didn't understand your question. But yeah, it's going to change at the tactical level because hopefully we're going to get to a point where we're much more interdependent than we have been. Uh, and, and instead of working as individual service components, we'll take a much more functional approach to executing operations. But at the same time that there are changes at the tactical level, I would say at the operational level, particularly going back to the Admiral's comments with respect to COCOMs versus services and what responsibilities are and who's what's job jar, um, if all we need to do is follow our currently established joint doctrine and overlay this concept onto it. Because I'm here to tell you, folks in all of the COCOMs are working the challenges of anti-access aerial denial today. What Air Sea Battle does is sort of highlight it and get people thinking about conceptually how do we do this, you know, better than we have in the past. So yeah, there's going to be changes at the tactical level, but I think working at the operational and strategic level, what Air Sea Battle does is kind of sheds light. I go back to, I'm not crazy about the title, but we're talking about how do you deny an adversary from gaining an advantage um, that denies us our ability to operate. Um, and, and, and that is something that all the COCOMs are working today. It's not like, you know, air sea battle's gonna come on board and displace work that's already being done. It should illuminate rather than replace. I, I think it's what you're gonna see is the continuing trend of uh, smaller forces that come together in aggregate so that um, while in World War II we were a mass kind of army where you know it was division versus division kind of army uh, we now start seeing small units out in the field and they aggregate together as uh, as required to bring firepower to bear uh, and the same is true in, in air power and so I think that trend will continue You'll continue to see small units operating out there autonomously and then being brought together through the network or through physical contact uh, to, to go mass on mass. Yeah. On mass where required. If I might add another thing, I, I think from our experiences in 90 and 91 up to 2004 and 5 in country to the future, uh, you'll see networking integration and jointness, not laminated after the fact on the battlefield by improvisation, but at a tactical level, purposely built uh, to, to work more effectively rather than you having to invent it on the fly in theater uh, to get an Air Force or a Navy system to work uh, at a tactical level in a, a more integrated way. Uh, sir. Are we buying the right stuff to support the air sea battle, and if not, where should we be making our investments? Let's uh, well, you've got, you, you have some efforts underway 
uh, at the macro level, again, there's so many different parts and pieces one could talk about, but yeah, we got people that are very interested in long-range reconnaissance strike and putting the money into building that kind of capability that can survive the kinds of threats that we envision in the future. You have folks that are exploring uh, U-class, um, which needs to be viewed as a revolutionary design system fully robust, not just as, you know, uh, some advanced MQ-1 or 9 uh, that can be launched off of the carrier, but we're talking about a revolutionary, penetrating, networked, survivable system with a degree of autonomy uh, to be able to defeat any kind of an electronic warfare uh, threat uh, that, you know, we, we, we simply have not accomplished yet today, but you have advocates uh, and money going into these systems. I, I would add on top of that that we, we are not putting enough money in, into some other parts of that, and specifically the networks. Uh, uh, you know, the, the Global Hawk BAMS uh, airframe is a perfect airframe to be a, uh, a satellite surrogate uh, to, to establish, uh, you know, local area, wide area network kind of coverage. Um, we haven't put a lot of money into things like uh, laser communications from these high altitude platforms so that uh, you have a very uh, uh, very strong, uh, almost unbreakable communications link uh, into the satellite system. Uh, and then we don't have really a good uh, terrestrial data link of the future. Uh, we've got plane to plane data links for uh, short range in the F-22, uh, but we're not really investing into a, uh, a data link that's going to be able to handle this high volume ISR traffic that's going to have to occur because uh, while stealth is still going to be a, uh, an important factor in platforms of the future, I think none of us here would expect that stealth will be uh, the Klingon cloaking device of the future. And so you're going to have to use the system of systems in order to fight your way in and fight your way out. And that's all going to have to be tied together with, uh, with these high-speed links. So I, I, I think there's a lot of work still. Yeah, let, let, me, let me just jump in there in terms of an example of what I talked about earlier, changing concepts of operation. Um, we have to reverse the paradigm of how we shift information around. Today we collect stuff, whether it's in space, uh, on the sea, in air, uh, and then we send it somewhere else to be processed. Folks, we're not going to be able to afford to do that anymore, and here's why, because the sensors are getting so capable, you all know this, that you amass so much data, there is no way anymore that a radio frequency data link is going to be able to handle. So you go to the laser comp piece. We're still thinking about that the wrong way collecting stuff, move it somewhere else, and then process it. No. We, we have computing capacity today where we can do the processing and exploitation on board the system. And then you just send out what the user is really interested in. You know, 99.99% of all the stuff that's collected is background and noise that no one's really interested in. So let's do the processing on board that then that is a different way of looking at the challenges that we currently have in moving information around. One little example. Thank you for your patience. You'll be the last That's questioner. Good. Thank you. Last is always good. <laughs> uh, Patty Renwright, uh, Navy Warfare and Doctor Command. Um, Two-part question. One is about the inter-service co collaboration for making air sea battle happen, and the other is about the new technology with cloud neck architecture. You know, my experience with working with uh, ASB has been, of course, uh, like we've seen over the past and being in also Navy for 20 some years, anytime there's collaboration, the Air Force perhaps wants fifth generation as a solution, Navy wants it different for resourcing. So who's paying for what, you know, and do you see it at your level, will it be at the SECDAF level that actually has to be the arbiter? You know, those that end up paying the bill, of course, want the final voice of what's being bought for resources. You know, where do you get the, the distillation of those final requirements? We can answer that first, or I can give my other question as well. Uh, real quick, I think I, and forgive me, I'm getting old, I can't hear real well anymore, but 
Um, I think I understand the gist of your question, but I think Air Sea Battle in its, remember at the beginning I said I wasn't crazy about the name because it focuses on the cooperation between mm -hmm. the Air Force and the Navy piece, not the, the real essence, which is the CONOPS. In response to your question, I think that is a strength because there's a realization now by the services, and if there's any one good thing that will accrue from this fiscal squeeze that the department's in, is it's getting folks to think about, well, you know, maybe we ought to think more toward interdependency as opposed to just interoperability. Mm -hmm. Interoperability, again, that's last, last century stuff. It's important, but we gotta get beyond that. So I think there's some hope in the context of the services now getting together before they make major financial investments, uh, you know, kind of doing what the J-ROC was supposed to do, mm -hmm. but without having it forced on them mm -hmm. to get folks to sit down and go, well, you know, here's what we're trying to do macro level. What do you think? Y you know, uh, I, I, there's a, a, a ray of hope there. Yeah, I, I would agree with Dave. I, I think that if anything, this pushes at least two of the services closer together to, to try to come to some common solutions. And there's some really hard hard questions out there that have got to be answered rather quickly. And uh, I, there's certainly good good karma at the top because General Schwartz and, and uh, Emma Greenard have been out pitching this together on the road. So I'm assuming that they're, uh, they're, they're talking together on a daily basis. And that, Will that pull the staffs together? I, you know, an example is the memorandum of agreement between the Air Force uh, and the uh, on the Navy on Global Hawk bands. Mm -hmm. That's true. You know, it, it made no sense to duplicate logistics facilities, training facilities, operations facilities, and so we came together and said, "Hey, why don't we cooperate and graduate here?" Um, and, and quite, practice. yeah, and quite frankly, um, you know, if I was king on that Global Hawk BAMS thing, I'd pay U.S. Navy on one side, U.S. Mm -hmm. Air Force on the other, and we would have had a common acquisition of the system. Mm -hmm. Well, then, you know? since we're limited on time as well, the second question is to talk about with the new technology. We're, every, the, the buzzword is cloud computing. All right, sounds really great. People's trying to put their brains around exactly what it encumbers. But part of that um, that I see what's still missing is it hasn't, been addressed, and if you've seen it on your level, the two four-star level, and the programmatics, is is DISA or is there going to be an arbitrary element that decides what is the standardization? Because you already see multiple vendors offering their own versions of multiple clouds. So will the Navy have their own, the Air Force? Next you know, we're stovepiped again. It's just another technology, and it sort of defeats the whole purpose. And then even addressing the issue, you know, with global networking architecture, you know, for non-kinetic long-range strikes, we're going to have issues with global servers that you have to negotiate going through another country's servers, just like we have overflight rights. Yeah. Thank you very much for outlining a very, very complex problem of which you're not going to get a solution from either one of us up here. <laughs> <laughs> However, um, it does raise the issue of trying to get to a point where perhaps standardization is not the issue, but rather working uh, common interfaces um, that are open architecture that would allow proprietary systems to plug in and then share information is perhaps a solution to what you articulate as, a as opposed to trying to come up with some standard. Because standards, I'm sorry, they don't work. It takes too long. Uh, there's too many disparate parties who don't want to agree on it. It doesn't fit many of the, the uh, uh, major uh, companies uh, business models, uh, but we do have to come up to um, a common open architecture adapter that allows these different proprietary uh, information systems to work uh, in a cohesive manner. Thank you, John. We're going to have to close off our little Irish wake here and turn <laughs> things back over to Admiral Daly. Well, I just want to say thank you and um, ask for a round of applause to our panelists for giving us this illumination.